So I want to, I just want to give you a little bit of background on an area that hasn't been a very active area of research up to now, but I think the, the advent of space-based asteroid seismology is going to change that. And this area is really, this field is really poised to uh, explode in the coming few years um, with the long interrupted data sets offered by Kepler in particular. Um, but I'll show you, give you a little bit of background on the theory uh, of stellar activity cycles and how it relates to astroseismology and um, then talk a little bit about an, an observing program that I started about several years ago in the Southern Hemisphere to prepare for um, the um, astroseismic data that are expected to come from the Song network ultimately. So um, I work in Boulder at the High Altitude Observatory, and most of my colleagues are solar physicists. And so if you plot the activity cycle period of a star versus its rotation period, this is what the diagram looks like to most of my colleagues. <laughs> uh, interesting. Um, but maybe lacks context. And the way that we get context for our understanding of the sun and its 11-year uh, sunspot cycle, 22-year solar cycle, magnetic cycle, uh, is to look at other stars and try to find these analogous or similar types of behaviors in other stars. And if you do that, uh, which the Mount Wilson survey did starting in the 1960s and so had several decades of observations to, uh, to sort of try to identify these types of uh, cycles in other stars. And here's the sort of cherry-picked um, best uh, subsample of their survey. And suddenly the sun looks more interesting in some ways uh, and less typical, uh, I think, than most solar physicists would be comfortable with, or in fact are comfortable with. So um, this is a version of this um, data set published in a, a paper by Erica Bonfitense a few years ago. And uh, basically, the, the stars here, the sample is from the Saar and Brandenburg 1999 sample of stars with well-measured uh, cycle periods and rotation periods. And you see that the, the stars fall along sort of two branches in this, in this diagram. So there are two relationships between the rotation period and the cycle period. And uh, they call this one the active branch. Uh, so uh, relatively rapidly rotating stars with periods spanning the full range of those uh, that are observed. And an inactive branch uh, where the relationship is, uh, the slope of that relationship is different. Uh, the speculation by Erica Bonvitense is that, uh, that these two branches represent two uh, dynamo mechanisms operating in distinct parts of the star. So, and in fact, uh, these triangles here on this inactive part of the branch correspond to secondary cycle periods in stars that appear on the active branch of, as well. So you can see in some cases two independent dynamo mechanisms operating in the same star on different time scales. And so the, the speculation is that these dynamos are, uh, these active branch dynamos are driven in the near surface shear layer, whereas these inactive branch stars are driven uh, in the shear layer at the base of the convective zone, the tachocline. Um, so the sun's not where it belongs for some reason. Uh, interestingly, the solar twin that's been uh, for a long time, 18 Scorpius, um, has uh, a cycle period measured, uh, has a rotation period similar to the sun, has a cycle period measured around seven years, uh, right where it belongs. So. Well, there's a number of peculiar things about the sun. Maybe we'll be able to solve that puzzle ultimately. This is motivation for um, these types of studies of solar type stars. Could you give us a very brief sketch of how those points are derived? What is the observational data that lets you know that the cycle period is 11 versus 22? I am just about to get to Very good. I would know that was supposed to be known by the audience. Next slide. Next slide. So how do you do these observations? Um, you can do it in the ultraviolet. You can do it in the optical. In the ultraviolet, um, it's done by taking time series measurements of the magnesium-2 H and K lines. And in the optical, it's the calcium-2 H and K lines. And so those data that I just showed were calcium H and K observations over several decades by the Mount Wilson survey. And so you just do synoptic. Um, basically, the measurements are relatively simple to make because it's a differential measurement. All you're doing is 
measuring the flux in the cores of the, of the line profiles and uh, adding those and dividing by the sum of the continuum levels of, of flux on either side of the, of the doublet. Um, what's the fluctuation of this cycle? What's the, I mean, is it very stable, the, the cycle time? Or well, it's tough because they're decades long that's, that's cycles. That's why I'm asking. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but, but Mount Wilson, for example, they're, they're taking like monthly measurements over four decades. So they have four decades of data. It's enough to measure several cycles in the longest or typical cycle periods. It's enough to measure one cycle in the longest cycle periods, like 25 years. That's what sets. So we don't know, but how stable they are. In some cases, we know that they are relatively stable. In other cases, uh, we don't know. But that sample, as I mentioned, was cherry-picked to be the most well-characterized systems. There are a number of systems that show quasi-periodic variations in, in, H and, in the H and K lines that are not clearly mono, you know, periodic, strictly speaking, right? They're quasi-periodic. Because the study is peculiar, but on the other hand, it's the only one where we have a very long series of data. That's true. So, in, the case, in the case of the sun, how stable is the cycle? Well, the, the solar cycle varies by 10% anyway, yeah, yeah. right? 9 to 13 years, typically. So the last, the last one, it was very late, wasn't it? Yes. Well, the, the current, current one, current one yeah. yeah, is about to be late. Yeah. <laughs> about to be late. Huh? It's so late that it isn't even late yet. It's yeah. about to be late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never comes. I thought it had started again. No, it's, it's on the rising phase okay. now. Okay. Yeah. So. So there's no difference in luminosity. You're really it's just in. There are in fact it shares the spectral signatures. There there are uh, variations in brightness as well. They're a lot harder to measure because they're small. Uh, and photometric measurements from the ground at the level of you know millimags over decades. It's it's a tough measurement to make. But they do have those types of measurements for some of those stars. And the interesting thing there is that in some cases. Uh, the brightness variations are directly correlated with the calcium HK variations. Um, and so that's opposite of what we see in the sun, right? The sun gets brighter when there are more spots because there are also more faculae. Uh, and so uh, those, that's an indication of a, of a spot-dominated um, cycle, whereas there are also faculae-dominated cycles. And so there's initial indications at least that um, that, that um, there are two different flavors, I guess. Uh, but most, by far, most of the measurements that have gone on uh, so far are these calcium H and K lines. And, and in the case of IUE measurements, which I'll show, I think, next, um, uh, you can do this in magnesium H and K. And so here is the mag uh, a space-based record of the magnesium H and K index um, in the sun uh, through a couple of of solar cycle. So you cle see clear 10% variations in this index through the solar cycle. And you can make these types of measurements for other stars. Um, here's a southern hemisphere star that I know is near and dear to Gulner, Beta Hydri. And uh, in, in this case, the, the actual the activity level, the overall activity level of Beta Hydri is much lower. It's an old solar type star. But the variations that we see are actually, you know, 30% variations over the cycle. So. It's a very powerful method to get at these um, at these cyclic variations that it's a lot easier to do than photometry. Um, and so in general, what we've learned from uh, studies of other stars is that the, both the mean activity level and the cycle period seem to scale with the Rossby number, which is the ratio of the rotation period to the convective time scale. Uh, that's just sort of a, a scaling relation derived from those initial studies by Mount Wilson. So how does this relate to astroseismology? Why am I talking about this here? Uh, well, a couple decades ago, it was, it was discovered in the sun that throughout the solar cycle, the p-mode frequencies in the sun um, shift slightly from minimum to maximum. And the size of those shifts are small. So this is 400 nanohertz, so 0.4 microhertz on a 3,000 microhertz signal. It's a, it's a tiny variation, but uh, important at the level of detailed modeling. So uh, those uh, frequency shifts are a function of frequency, and they're also a function of the angular degree of the modes. Of course, in the sun, we have the advantage of being close, and so we can see very high angular degrees. But um, even in sun as a star measurements, 
if you just look at the uh, L equal 0, 1, 2, and 3, and average the shifts in those uh, three uh, angular degrees, um, and that's in red here through uh, one of the recent um, solar cycles, and then this is the sunspot number for comparison. So you see there's a very strong correlation between even the sun as a star measurements of frequency shifts and the solar cycle. Uh, so the idea here is to make measurements of those p-mode frequency shifts as an independent means of assessing uh, what's responsible, what's behind these, uh, the internal changes that are going on during a solar cycle. What's behind, what's the mechanism that causes these p-mode shifts to change? And that this is an independent way of probing the mechanism that's responsible for the solar cycle and cycles in other stars. So the initial theoretical interpretation of, uh, of how these p-mode shifts are caused came from Goldreich et al. in 1991, shortly after their discovery and characterization. Uh, and basically, they, to first order, they just said, well, this is just a, magnetic perturb a direct magnetic perturbation to the near surface uh, propagation speed of the p-mode waves. And that did a pretty good job of explaining the observations. Um, but and basically, nobody looked at this for another 15 years until Jimbowski and Goody um, said, well, maybe there are some secondary effects as well. And um, they used not only the P modes, but the F modes, which show uh, uh, shifts that, are, that have a different dependence on frequency. And so um, considering not only those direct magnetic perturbations to the near surface propagation speed, but also uh, changes in the convective velocity and the associated changes in temperature, in those near surface layers. They were able to simultaneously explain the shifts observed in the P modes as well as those in the F modes. And so it's a, it gives us some confidence that this um, picture of what's responsible for those shifts is um, relatively sound. So um, OK, so. So can I go back and ask, so, so how do mm -hmm. they, so what do they? <laughs> What are they modeling to get this? I mean, how do they change the magnetic field? Well, that's what I'm about to get oh, to. Sorry. <laughs> that's good. So when we first started getting this type of data for other stars, um, I asked Wojtek Dombowski to try to figure out how the how his basic model of how this works in the sun would change, um, would scale with stellar properties, basically. And so what we needed was a way to convert the observed changes in some index like the magnesium H and K index or the calcium H and K index and convert those into p-mode shifts, right? So we use the sun to, uh, to calibrate that, that relationship. And basically, uh, so now this delta nu, uh, just to confuse you, is not the one that we've been talking about as the large frequency separation over the last days, uh, but instead is the frequency shift, okay? <laughs> and um, Wojtek basically parameterizes it as a scale factor uh, times R over M times a, um, a, a normalized mode inertia ratio that is a function of the depth of the source of that perturbation beneath the photosphere. And um, if you look at the amplitude of the, of the perturbation as a function of the solar cycle, um, you can either optimize the value of that depth uh, throughout this for each individual data point or just fix it to its sort of average level. In both, in both cases, uh, you capture the essential change in the magnesium 2 index uh, over, the, over the cycle. And so uh, just because there are relatively few observables, we chose to just fix the depth of the source uh, for the sun at the 0.3 megameters below the surface. And um, assume that for other stars that that depth might scale with the pressure scale height, which is you know, some function of the mass, radius, and luminosity for other stars. So um, with that relationship between the changes in the, in the magnesium-2 index and the p-mode frequency shifts, we could then, um, I'm getting ahead of myself, afraid. We could then um, make sure that it works for the sun. So this, this is the observed shift in the sun as a function of frequency, and then different colors show uh, how that frequency dependence depends on angular degree. Um, and when you normalize by our expression, you take out essentially all of that degree 
and frequency dependence. So we're able to explain most of that degree and frequency dependence with this simple parameterization. Uh, and so the idea then is to apply this to other stars and see if it works. Um, and the first uh, case that we had was beta hydri, in fact. Uh, the previous plot I showed of its activity cycle stopped here, uh, but there were additional IUEA data later in the early 90s, and so we went back to the archive, reanalyzed all the data, and derived an improved cycle period and phase for the magnesium-2 index, um, and then compared the, um, there were, actually there were two astroseismic data sets for this star separated by five years, which is close to half the cycle. Turned out that one of them was just a little bit past maximum, and one of them was near minimum, so it maximized our opportunity to actually see the P-mode frequency shift due to this thing. We used Voitech's um, scaling law to predict how big the shift should be, and in the bottom here, you're seeing a comparison of the model predictions with the observations. So the red is the model here, so it's a positive shift um, and it has some weak frequency dependence. Uh, the observations have huge uncertainties. So there's two observational data points here. The gray shaded region is just the cross-correlation of the two epochs of astroseismic data. So you see a bulk shift of the p-modes in one direction or another, and it happens to be in the same direction as the model predicts, so that's good. Uh, and the other is the single p-mode with the same uh, identification, uh, N equal 18 radial mode, that appeared in both data sets. Uh, they're stochastically driven oscillations, and so you don't always see the same modes every time you look. But this one appeared in both data sets, and we were able to measure the shift in that single frequency. Uh, and that also is in the right direction, but with an uncertainty that makes the detection not really statistically significant. So, so how hard is it to measure the shift, which is around like 0.1 microns? Uh, why the lifetime of the mode make the, the lines? I mean, the modes being uh, uh, the width of the mode is much longer than this, usually, right? Yeah. Uh, I wonder if it's not really, I mean, does it pose any problem to determine these such low, such, such small variations to the. It's a difficult measurement, to be sure. Um, but the line width is not the, I mean, as long as you resolve the mode, as long as your data set, the primary limitation here, the reason the error bars are so big in this case is because the, the lines are not resolved. The modes are not resolved. We only have one or two weeks of data from ground-based uh, campaigns. Whereas from space, you have a long enough data set that you're actually resolving the modes, and then um, you, you can take advantage of the fact that um, uh, this bulk frequency shift, you're, you're looking at the cross-correlation of many modes, and so you can kind of beat down the noise that way um, and the effects of the, of the intrinsic widths. So it, no matter what, it's a tough measurement to make, but um, it's getting easier and easier as the data sets get longer and uninterrupted and as uh, the sample of stars grows larger. So, so uh, view this as like a proof of principle that um, this type of measurement is possible in principle and that uh, our theoretical uh, underpinnings of our understanding of, of how it works is qualitatively correct, okay? So uh, this basically motivated uh, around that time in 2007 uh, an initiation of a project to observe uh, in calcium H and K the brightest um, magnitude greater uh, less than six stars in the southern hemisphere. It turned out that most of the astroseismic data coming from the ground were in the southern hemisphere be just because of who was doing the work, right? Tim Bedding and the Danes. So we had Australia and South, South America. And so a lot of the astroseismology was in the south, southern hemisphere. But the Mount Wilson survey was the northern hemisphere. And so we had plenty of calcium HK record over decades for stars in the northern hemisphere, but nothing in the south, almost, almost nothing. Uh, and so we said, well, before the song network gets started, uh, why don't we start monitoring the stellar activity cycles of those stars that it will target so we know exactly where they are in the phase of their activity cycle when they get observed by song and hopefully observed again half a cycle later, right? Uh, and so we started this project in 2007 with partners at Yale and Georgia State University and Space Telescope. And it's um, these small telescopes at Cerro Tololo are now run as a, a sort of semi-private consortium. NOAO still has access to the telescopes, but most of the time is going to these partners in the SMARTS consortium, 
and they run it like in queue schedule mode with a service observer. So you don't even need to go to the telescope. You just um, upload a, a queue for your, for your program. And it's a very effective way of doing a synoptic program like this where we need 10 nights a year. We need it an hour here, an hour there, not 10 nights a year. We need uh, the equivalent of 10 nights a year spread over the whole year as evenly as possible. Uh, and so in practice, what we get is for a sample of 60 bright stars in the southern hemisphere, we get two or three uh, measurements per month. It's a relatively low resolution uh, spectrograph that goes out to calcium H and K. And uh, we just monitor all these bright southern targets and look for acti activity variations. Now, I know this plot is uh, not very pretty, but what I want you to get from it is this is the uh, calcium index as a function of year, and it covers five years. And this star here is Tau Ceti, which has um, uh, long been a candidate for the uh, old sun-like star in a Maunder minimum-like phase. So it should have very flat. Um, in fact, in the Mount Wilson survey, it's, it's an equatorial region, so they can get it too. It was flat over the four decades. Never showed any significant variations in activity. And so this you can think of as a, uh, a monitor of uh, possible systematics that are coming into our measurements. And you see a, some evidence of some systematics in this season uh, that are caused by uh, a new service observer coming online and coming up to speed with the, with the procedures. So uh, this season, he's doing much better so far. <laughs> um, so that started um, four years ago. And this was the first um, major interesting scientific result to come out of it. Uh, one of our targets is HD 17051, Iota Horologi, which is also an exoplanet host star. And we discovered just last year um, a 1.6 year activity cycle, very clear activity cycle in this star. A 1.6 years is, is now the record holder for the shortest known activity cycle of a solar type star. And um, the reason that's exciting that if these short activity cycles are at all common, um, then that's short enough to be within the mission of the lifetime of the Kepler satellite. And so we can see a full stellar cycle. We don't have to wait a, a whole decade to get uh, a complete stellar cycle and, and study the uh, resulting shifts in the V modes. Uh, our sampling was dense enough in some places that we could get some indication of the rotation period of this star. I don't think by itself it would be enough to claim a detection of the eight and a half day rotation period, but that was known from previous studies already, so we basically just confirmed that that's it. So it's rotating about three times the solar rate with this very short activity cycle. And it turns out that um, this star had been the subject of an astroseismic campaign by Sylvie Vauclair in the maximum around 2007. And during its observing season in 2013, at the, not the next minimum, but the one after that, it will um, be well placed for another astroseismic campaign so we can compare the uh, frequencies that are, were seen in 2007 if we repeat those measurements in 2003. It's a great opportunity. Is it a hot Jupiter host or what kind of planet? Uh, it is like a Jupiter-sized planet, but in a more like a one-year orbit. Oh, okay. So 300 days or something. Not 1.6 years, yes. actually. <laughs> Luckily. So what is the law of I mean, what is this? This is a periodogram of, the, of these data. So uh, on top of the um, stellar activity variations, um, like the cyclic ones, you also see rotational modulation on top of that, just individual spots coming on and off the disk. And if you do the, the period, periodogram of that data set, you get a peak at eight and a half days, which is the known rotation period. So uh, it's just an indication that for some, of our for some of our sample, we'll be able to provide at least some information about rotation as well, which is part of what goes into Dynamos, right? So. Well, but I guess I'm, gonna, I'm wondering, I mean, for the sun, you wouldn't get that result, right? Because the differential rotation across is a function of, uh, is a function of latitude. Uh, so what, I'm wondering whether, you know, that this depends on where the spot was in latitude. If you think this looks like the solar rotation. Differential rotation either fattens your peak or gives you multiple peaks yeah. around a, a region, and and so you'd see you'd see an indication of that as well. I mean, uh, it depends on for how long you observe. I mean, if you observe the sun only for a couple of years, then the activity belt is at a certain place, and so you measure that rotation period, right? So there's some intrinsic uncertainty because of that possibility for differential. Well, that's rotation. what I'm getting at is that on the 1.6 year cycle, it would be interesting to see 
if this period changes eight and a half days. Oh, like measure rotation through the cycle. Exactly. To look for it, yeah. Like you would for the sun, just as you said. Yeah, yeah. For the you sun, could... you'd expect that. Yeah. yeah. So if you think it's undergoing the same kind of magnetic cycles, then this period should be, this period should be changing as a function of the cycle. Yeah. We don't have enough data yet to be able to do that. No, we certainly don't. Um, but if with a long enough data set, you could sort of divide the data into low activity, high activity, and look for that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Good idea. Well, how many points do you have to, to make such periods? How many do we have? Yeah. Well, I mean, the important thing is that you're sampling often enough compared to the rate, yes. right, mm -hmm. um, that well, it's not just noise. Uh, in this case, I'm not sure that we have that level of sampling, right? We're getting two or three data points a month. So you plot only a part of the result? No, these are all the measurements that we actually have. And so if you were to ask me the significance of this peak, <laughs> it's the highest peak that's in the periodic graph. <laughs> But like I said, it's not enough by its own to measure the rotation period in this case. So we need higher density of data. And so more time on the telescopes is always a good thing. So uh, after we published this result, uh, which came around here, where it's a really nice clean cycle, then it really went all to hell. Um, and I think what's happening here is that, if you remember, um, there was those two branches of activity cycles. And this 1.6 year cycle corresponds to that lower branch, the short activity cycles are all on the inactive branch. And uh, the active branch cycle period will be much, much longer, many, many years, um, seven years, eight years, 10 years. And so we were probably at the minimum of the primary cycle to get this very clean signature. And then it's on its way back up now. And so you're getting a convolution of this short cycle on top of the, of the, the small cycle. So, so in some sense, we got lucky uh, looking when we did to, to pull out that one and a half year. 1.6 year cycle. But we'll continue to monitor it and, and see how, how much the activity cycle varies from one to the next. OK, so just to show you a few other examples of stars where we see short period variations where we, haven't, we don't have enough data yet maybe to measure an unambiguous cycle period. But we're clearly seeing some interesting things. And these are all targets that were also observed by the Mount Wilson survey because they're in the equatorial. And so we have some overlap with them. So it's comforting to check our results against those previously known variations. And so uh, for this star, HD 76151, uh, the Mount Wilson survey found a two and a half year cycle. And we confirm, uh, not quantitatively yet, but basically a, a two and a half year cycle in that star. Uh, they found evidence of a five year cycle in the uh, young solar type star Epsilon Airy. And we see uh, definite variations uh, probably um, with a shorter period than five years, it looks like to me. So there's some evidence that the period may have actually changed from those earlier measurements from Mount Wilson to our measurements. And then here's a case where uh, there are clear variations, but they're not clearly periodic. So if you believe that uh, there's a maximum somewhere over here and over here, you would expect another one here. and it, doesn't look strictly periodic in this case. Um, but this was one that was classified uh, by Mount Wilson as an irregular variable. So variable, but irregular in, in period. So. so our measurements are capable of finding these uh, short periods. And we're, we're um, based on what we've seen so far, we believe that these short activity cycles might be more common than anyone previously thought, um, just because nobody was sampling with the kind of regularity that we're able to with this Q-scheduled program. So we're hopeful that that's the case, because if it is the case, then Kepler is going to see all kinds of, of cycles uh, in the p-modes. So let me just give you a taste of uh, the first space-based detection of p-mode frequency changes due to an activity cycle, presumably due to an activity cycle, I say, because we haven't totally measured the activity cycle in the star yet, although we're in the process of doing that. So this is the star HD 49933. And uh, what you're seeing here is, as a function of time, uh, the amplitude of the p-modes, a measure of the amplitude, bulk amplitude of the p-modes, and a measure of the frequency shifts right, relative to some reference value. And so this star was observed twice by Koro, uh, one season, a short run, and then a second long run uh, a year later. And during the long run, you see um, very clear uh, changes in the frequency with anti-correlated changes in the amplitude, which is exactly what you see in the sun as well. During minimum activity, the amplitudes of the p-modes in the sun is maximum. So 
uh, and the frequency shifts is minimum. And that's exactly what you see in this star as well. Not only that, but um, the amplitude of those shifts as a function of frequency is an increasing function of frequency, just as we saw in the sun. Uh, and there's some weird behavior that's so far unexplained at very high frequencies, um, but something interesting that might teach us something new. Uh, so after this uh, initial detection, we started monitoring the star in HK. It was at the very end of its season, so we got one data point. Uh, and then picked it back up the next season, and we see some interesting variations in the uh, calcium H and K. And we don't know exactly how many times it uh, cycled while we weren't looking, but we do know that at amplitude maximum, it had to be at cycle minimum. So we have that constraint. And currently, we can put a lower limit on that cycle period of 220 days, but it could be any of these. In any case, it's short, it's significantly shorter than two years. Uh, there's no scenario in which it can be longer than that. How bright is the star? Uh, it's a Koro target, so it must be like six. six. It's a bright. It's a yeah. It's definitely brighter than six because um, uh, that's the limit of our of our sample. So, um, so the update on this is that we're continuing to monitor it. We just picked it up um, this season, uh, and Koro will do another long run this fall while we're monitoring in calcium HK. And we're really hoping that we'll see this next cycle maximum or something to um, definitely measure the cycle period and correlate those changes in the H and K index with the changes that Koro observes in the P mode frequencies and other characteristics of the nodes. Uh, so if uh, Koro can do this, Kepler can do it uh, on a very large sample of stars um, all at the same time and over a longer period of time. Uh, the Koro result, um, I don't know if you noticed, but the, the actual the size of the frequency shifts, um, just for reference, remember it's about a half a microhertz in the sun. And in, in, um, in this star, it's one to two microhertz. So bigger frequency shifts than observed in the sun. And uh, we've got our prediction of how big it should be as a function of the spectral type of the star. And then there was a separate uh, prediction by Bill Chaplin and others um, that was just sort of uh, based on the sun alone, not based on any stellar data. And so you see they make opposite predictions for stars hotter than the sun. Uh, Ch the Chaplin scaling predicts lower amplitudes at, hot, at high temperatures, and our scaling predicts larger amplitudes at high temperatures. And so there's a clear winner, Wojtek Jimbowski, yay. Uh, <laughs> but there are several dozen Kepler targets that uh, since the beginning of the mission have already been monitored seasonally in calcium H and K. And so there's, a, there's at least a few of the, of the bright Kepler targets that will have both astroseismic data and contemporaneous calcium H K data from the Nordic Optical Telescope to do this kind of study, study on, a, on a larger sample of stars. And if Koro is an indication of what we're going to see in other stars, then we should easily pull it out with Kepler. So the future looks bright. Um, these satellite missions are really going to improve our um, ability to uh, try to understand dynamos not just in the sun, which might be peculiar after all, uh, but also in these other stars and investigate the two branches of, of uh, stellar activity cycles. But we need to have this ground-based data to, to perform those correlations between things that we know well uh, and have long historical records on, like calcium H and K, uh, compared to those things that we know less well, but can measure very well from Kepler, like the frequency shifts. Um, and eventually, the hope is that if we get this kind of data for a large enough sample of stars, we'll be able to move beyond this simple kind of scaling from solar data and really get at the physics of what's going on uh, in, the, in the stars and the relationship between the H and K and the, <laughs> and the frequency shifts. So onward and upward. So, Travis, I'm still. <laughs> so, I, I, can you just roughly schematically tell us, theoretically, how people think the magnetic field is changing to explain <laughs> the phenomenon? What dynamo models? <laughs> the, what do people do to calculate this? Like how? Prediction. How do, I mean, you have to you have to have some underlying model for. 
Are you just doing one of toroidal fields at the base of the convection zone and changing the sound speed, and that changes the solar cycle? Or are you? So, so uh, maybe there's there's two two ways for me to interpret your question. So tell me which one is right. Are you asking what's driving the solar dynamo and stellar dynamos in general, or are you asking what in the dynamo is affecting the p-mode frequencies? The latter. Okay, that's an easier question to answer. Uh, uh, so Goldrack's idea was that it was a direct magnetic perturbation on the near surface uh, propagation speed of the modes. You're basically changing the outer boundary condition, right? So you're changing the size of the acoustic cavity slightly, very slightly. Uh, think of the magnetic field as if the global magnetic field strength is changing over time, then you're 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 changing the uh, you're stiffening the equation of state in the near surface layers, and so it changes the acoustic radius of the star very, very minutely. But then, as Jambowski and Goody uh, showed, there are these secondary um, effects on the turbulent velocity. That's kind of a, a almost a direct effect of the magnetic field and the change in temperature in those near surface layers as well. So, and those matter as well. <clears throat> so that's our current best understanding. Those those three things: direct magnetic perturbation. Oh, when you're fully active, what fraction of the convective volume has these rising flux tubes? Because they've been able to sort of image the rising flux tubes due to the perturbations on the, the, the modes, high, high, high angular order modes. I don't see these uh, P-mode frequency shifts as a reflection of those individual discrete events. I see these as a, as a, as a response to the global changes that are happening. Um, there might be signatures of those individual events, but the those would be much, much more difficult to measure, I, I would think. Are you excited? I'm totally excited. I'm, I can't wait for Kepler to pull some of these out. And, uh, there's only one star other than the sun for which the measurements have been made? The one you for which before. significant, statistically significant measurements have been made. If you count beta hydri, then. No, no, uh, there's, a sig well, there's a, a high order. High. Yeah, only this one co target has been measured and published. Got it. There are a couple other co targets where similar studies have been attempted, and they show some interesting variations, but nothing that's obviously cyclic at this point. The 150 days is the longest the co can stare at an individual target, so you're kind of limited. And I know that the people who do this type of analysis are uh, already starting to work on the extended Kepler data sets, and um, I'm sure that interesting variations are going to be found if they haven't already. That's just speculation. Though.